insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 84. Kings, orchestras, and squadrons. Pew, pew. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my contemplative and relaxed co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. And why are you contemplative and relaxed today? I don't know why I'm contemplative, but I'm relaxed because I had a massage this morning. Yeah, I kind of figured you'd be contemplative because of that, too. Oh, sure. We'll go with that, too. Yeah, why not? It's just one of those days. Sure, why not? It's a Sunday. We normally don't do our podcast on Sunday. So. Yeah, it's just a slow weekend. Yeah, relaxed. That's okay. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, we went and got flu shots yesterday. That was our big family outing. How exciting outing. was that? That was, wow. that was fun. Yeah. Yeah, the, the <laughs> child loved that. Yeah, yeah, she was not, not too happy. But yeah. you know what? You got to stay safe during That's, all of this. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So today, we have a lot of stories to talk about. Yes, we do. In our Disney detective, we will talk about the return of the Lion King. We will say farewell to a musical favorite. And we will also talk about some mass layoffs at the parks. In our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, pew pew, we'll talk about Star Wars Squadrons. (laughs) <laughs> we will talk about Cassian Andor and his show going in a little slightly different direction. And some more Mando rumors, because it's not a show without Mando rumors. There you go. Then in our entertainment news this week, we'll talk about Cobra Kai ready to <sighs> attack again. And we'll talk about the fate of a favorite show of ours at Orville. Then we'll finish up with our insightful picks. We do have some afterthoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, real quick afterthoughts to go over on conventions. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll see what we got. Yep. Before we get into it, though, I would uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera, all your podcast applications. Yep. Uh, we would also ask for your feedback. Let us know how we're doing, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, anything you'd like us to talk about. Or stop talking about. Or stop, yeah, if you want to stop talking about those Mando <laughs> rumors, you let us know. Um, you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. Or you can reach out to us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. And I think we'll save the rest of the plugs for the sure. end of the show. Uh, ready to get started? Let's do it. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So it seems that The Lion King is getting a follow-up movie. Um, It seems that the film will continue with the photorealistic technology that director Jon Favreau used in the 2019 film and also the 2016 film, uh, The Jungle Book. Uh, This article actually came from Deadline.com. It said that there's no release date as of right now for the follow-up, and obviously production hasn't even started. Started, but it's a uh, you know it's kind of top priority since the last film uh, grossed 1.6 billion worldwide. Um, so they're keeping the storyline kind of under wraps right now. Uh, but the article says that they kind of got a hint that it would be kind of exploring the mythology of the characters, including Mufasa's origin story, um, kind of moving the story forward while also looking back. And the person that wrote the article said that it kind of reminded them of The Godfather Part Two. Uh, so kind of go forward, kind of look back. Um, and also, you know, see how they incorporate, you know, music, 
um, as well, uh, you know, because that was a big part of the 1994 classic, uh, animated classic, and then obviously in the 2019 version, as well as the Broadway show. So again, not much news about it, just basically that it's that it's in the work. So I'm sure as time goes on, we'll probably hear uh, more about it. But kind of exciting news to to hear because they did sequels to the animated ones, which were direct to video versions. So it'll be nice to see, you know, what real story they kind of, you know, come up with for. Well, it, so. and I hope if they're going to do a Mufasa centric story that they're able to get James Earl Jones back mm -hmm. to do the voice because it's so characteristic. Right, right. But obviously he doesn't have that voice until he's much older. Right. So if, absolutely, you know. But I like I almost picture this as though Mufasa's telling his story. True, with, I could see that flashbacks and up until I could definitely the point see of the that. But you know, and maybe what led him and Scar to have such a you know, tumultuous yeah. relationship even. And it would know. even be nice, you know, we have the one scene in Lion King where they, they you know, talk about, you know, you look at the stars and mm -hmm. your ancestors. So right. it would be kind of neat to to sort of reflect on that a little bit yeah. and talk about his father and, mm -hmm. and you know, kind of an inspirational yeah. coming of age story type thing. Yeah, I could see that. So should be interesting. Yeah. No release dates or anything like that? Nope. No actors named or anything yet nope, for it? No, nothing. It's basically, it's all, you know, pre-production at this point, so. Okay, well, it's probably looking a couple of years before it comes yeah. out then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, good story. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the orchestra that we're losing. So this is this is kind of sad. Um, this was, this article actually came from um, W-E-S-H, uh, television station which is out of um orlando and it's um the story uh came out le actually last saturday i believe it, it came out so it was after we had done our our last show that news uh started popping up all over place um and that as of i believe it was uh yesterday the grand floridian society orchestra was playing its last show this week um, the group was actually furloughed at the start of the pandemic. Um, and in this article, they actually spoke with one of the members of the group, um, Corey Paul. And he said, as a trombonist, there are so many, there are only so many types of gigs that you can get. A gig where you're inside playing jazz, that's kind of a dream. He said, uh, the group had announced on Facebook that as of October 3rd, our days at Walt Disney World will come to an end. Uh, he said a lot of people's reasons for staying at the Grand Floridian was the band. Since COVID-19, Disney shut down and then um, and when everything started to come back little by little, the group was actually rebranded as the Disney Society Orchestra. And they actually had put them in Hollywood Studios as a stage show. Um, and it was kind of a, a cute little show, something different than what they had normally played when they would perform in the lobby of the Grand Floridian. Um, but then, unfortunately, um, they got a notice that the theater was going dark and that they were basically being let go. Um, and most of the group has been together for 32 years. Um, so he said, as much of it is a bummer to see the band go, anyone will tell you a 32 year run. That's a very long time for a group. So that's pretty incredible. Um, they, you know, the orchestra had basically had all commented saying that uh, we will never forget you and how wonderful you've made us feel and we'll all miss you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And they obviously hope at some point to be playing again. But at this point, there's, you know, nothing uh, in the works for that. Um, and kind of along the lines of the... Um, the orchestra being let go, another resort favorite, um, Yeehaw Bob uh, Jackson, who has been a regular fixture at Disney's Port Orleans Riverside for 23 years, he also had gotten notification that he was um, being 
being released as as well. Um, during the shutdown, he's been doing weekly sing-alongs on his Facebook Live. So he's kind of still been been out there. Um, so he, you know, had uh, released the news also last week. Um, and a lot of people, again, for staying at the Grand Floridian to see the orchestra play or staying at... Um, you know, New Orleans, Riverside to see his week, you know, daily shows as well are a lot of reasons why, you know, guests would stay at these, you know, different resorts. So it's kind of sad to see the end of an era for, you know, the, these performers. So, yeah, it, it's unfortunate. I mean, it's, it's certainly a sign of the times and, mm-hmm. and how, yeah, normal isn't normal anymore. No. And, uh, you know, maybe someday we can get back to normal, Mm -hmm. but putting that aside just for a second and, and, you know, I'm, I'm one to bash Disney Mm -hmm. every chance I get. And I'm not going to, in this case here, I mean, I think Disney's doing what they need to do given the circumstances, Mm -hmm. but the one thing that I do want to give Disney credit for is for cultivating this town. This band Mm -hmm. has been together for over 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Disney for putting these guys together mm-hmm. and for putting all the other musical talent together. Yep. To enter, and because no one paid to see these guys. Right. They, you know, these were free shows that were mm-hmm. done. Yeah. You know, it wasn't paid admission. So it was, it was basically the ambiance that mm-hmm. Disney would, would create within its resort. Absolutely. And, and because of the circumstances, that has to change mm-hmm. for right now. But I certainly don't see, we might not see the same acts come back. Right. But I, I don't have, I have no doubt that Disney's going to reinvest in these talented mm-hmm. organizations and these talented individuals again. Right. When the time is appropriate. Mm-hmm. We've been to, we've not stayed at the Grand Floridian uh, since you and I have been together, but we've right. been there. Mm-hmm. We've yeah. heard these guys play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it sets the tone absolutely for the entire resort. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't think they're going to go without that music for very long. Right, they're probably for a while, you know. And the other thing too was Grand Floridian. From what I remember, they weren't one of the resorts that was that was opened. They were actually one of the resorts that the NBA they were was for the NBA yeah. that the NBA was staying at. So. You know, kudos to Disney for giving them an opportunity to to play somewhere when the right. park opened. It's right. just unfortunately, you know, unfortunate that they they changed things. And I think a lot of that has to do with when the park reopened. It was still, you know, the end of the summer. So attendance, while it was limited, was still higher. Now you're getting into the off season, season the off season where you're not having as many people come so you know they've already talked about park hours you know being uh you know limited and things like that so obviously limited unfortunately guest experiences you know as well but disney is is the, you know really the best at setting the mood and setting the atmosphere of of all their locations, be it a resort or be it a park um, or a restaurant. And, you know, they, they know how to make you feel like you're immersed in, in everything and having the orchestra there just, you know, totally sets the mood while I'm sure they'll probably have music playing. It just won't feel the same as having the live. Right. And, and again, this is, this is probably going to be a temporary. It mm-hmm. might not be the same band that comes back. Right. It might be a different group of guys that, Disney, that come back. Disney is renowned for their ability to find talent, mm-hmm. whether yeah. it's for the parks mm-hmm. or movies or whatever. It's just, it's unfortunate mm-hmm. that this is how things are right now, but hopefully yeah. they're not going to be like this forever. Right. But kudos to Disney for giving us this opportunity to enjoy mm-hmm. these musicians in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if, if these guys have any um, CDs or, or any music online, but the uh, other performer, uh, Bob Jackson, he actually does have his own, you know, original music. He has his own uh, CD. So hopefully he can kind of continue his online presence, yeah. um, you know, going forward. So, so 
on the heels of that unfortunate news, <sighs> yeah. what other unfortunate Disney news do we have? Yeah, so this, you know, came out, you know, let, let's just, you know, keep the, the sadness going. So, you know, from CNN and obviously other news outlets uh, reported this as well, uh, Disney is actually laying off a total of 28,000 people in the United States as the, you know, coronavirus pandemic hammers its park and resort business. So now this article, it didn't mention, um, where the breakdown was going to be, um, you know, which, which park, which area. Um, but it, it did say that the company said that 67% of the employees that are going to be laid off will be part time workers. Um, Disney Parks and Resorts Division has more than 100,000 U.S. employees um, on both uh, coasts. Um, so the chairman of uh, Disney Parks had said uh, the staffing cuts were obviously necessary because of the prolonged impact of the coronavirus on the business. And that includes limited capacity due to physical distancing requirements and the continued uncertainty uh, regarding the uh, duration of the pandemic. He said, as a result, this decision uh, today, we believe that the steps we are taking will enable us to emerge a more effective and efficient operation when we return to normal. Uh, he said, we look forward to providing opportunities where we can for when they return. So, you know, they also say some of the, the issues for the layoffs is because California still has yet to open. They were hoping to open, in you know mid July and as of right now there's still no you know date for the opening of uh Disneyland or California Adventure only the shopping area downtown Disney is open um none of the resorts are open so again they they really didn't say what percentage is um is in which location Obviously, a number of people in Florida did receive uh, notices because there were a lot of employees that were furloughed, um, <clears throat> you know, at the start of it. And some people were getting notices to come back while only, you know, so many, uh, you know, were coming back in, in some capacity. Um, and now, you know, there's really no information again as to when things could could open back up or you know again what the breakdown of you know the the amount of of people obviously just like most other you know companies they they took a big hit you know as soon as the parks closed um you know they ended up losing you know a billion dollars uh just in the first few weeks from you know the, the parks, but yet they were still able to supply, you know, health benefits and things like that. So it, it's just, it's very sad, you know, sad to hear. And so. these are, I mean, 28,000 employees is an alarming number, but mm -hmm. to put that in the perspective, you know, just in Florida alone, mm -hmm. Disney's the single largest employer mm -hmm. in the state of Florida. Yeah. So they employ millions mm -hmm. of employees you know, across all their divisions. Right. So, yes, 28,000 is a lot, but it's a small percentage compared to how many people still fortunately have their jobs. Oh, absolutely. You know, you and I have been extremely fortunate mm -hmm. that we've continued to work unimpeded. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still going into the office myself, yep. you know, and, I'm, and I, we've been very fortunate with safety protocols at the office. Mm -hmm. You've been fortunate that your employer allows you to work from home at this point in time. Yeah, 30 weeks now, <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> but, you know, this is a story that's mm -hmm. repeated across multiple businesses, Absolutely. across multiple industries. We're, we're going on, probably we're looking at at least another five to six months of this before, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, a vaccine is available mm -hmm. and readily distributed to mm -hmm. the masses. Yeah. So we're maybe halfway through this crisis right now. Mm -hmm. And and Disney's doing what it has to do. It's laying off 28,000 employees so that it can continue to employ those other employees right. that they do have. Right. 
And a lot of employers are faced with that tough mm-hmm. decision right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, people are doing the best that they can under absolutely circumstances that nobody ever envisioned having mm-hmm. to deal with. Mm-hmm. It's unfortunate. And hopefully when things pick up and we start to move back into that normalcy again, mm-hmm. you'll see a lot of those people get rehired back to accommodate yeah. the park. So that was all we had for our Disney detective this week, which mm-hmm. is pretty good because it was a lot of bad news. Uh, let's take a quick break and we'll come back with tales from the edge of the galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Pew, 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 pew. (laughs) So it seems a new Star Wars game came out. (gasps) And let me guess, you've played it. (laughs) Yeah, extensively. (laughs) Extensively. And our daughter has even played it starting today as well. Um, So, you know, obviously I can't speak for it and i think you'll probably give more detail about it next week maybe um you know hint hint spoilers spoilers uh but star wars squadrons has arrived it debuted on console and uh pc and the video game basically puts you in uh controls inside the cockpit of an x-wing or a TIE fighter, um, and it's a first-person dogfighting experience, and the original, uh, and the, uh, storyline is actually set after the events of Return of the Jedi. Would that be correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a whole cast of, I guess, fighters that you either play as or play with? Yeah. Would that be correct? <laughs> I feel like I'm interrogating you. Is this correct? Um, So, of course, the story, you know, talks about, you know, if you're fighting as the New Republic, you're part of the Vanguard uh, squadron. um, And your motto is fearless to the finish. And it, you know, talks about all these different characters. I guess uh, some are uh, survivors of the Clone Wars um, and other various characters. And then, of course, you have... Um, you know, the, uh, intelligent chief who is a, uh, uh, Amon, uh, Calamari. So you have various different, it's a trap. <laughs> different species, obviously. So, you know, your typical thing. And then of course you have the Imperials, um, who are trying to bring down the new Republic. Um, and they're part of the Titan squadron. Does any of this make sense? Absolutely. Good, because it makes absolutely no sense to me. (laughs) So I'm so glad it makes sense to you. Um, So players will also see uh, an array of new ships in the Rebel Alliance and the Imperial fleets, including the Temperance, the Overseer, and the Skyhawk. Have you seen all of those? Some of them, yes. Okay, so you haven't gotten far enough in the game yet to see them. I have not. No. Okay. Um, so obviously you can learn more about this on StarWars.com. Um, and there's a trailer, you know, available that uh, you can watch as well. Oh, you're going to play it? I'm going to play it, but no sound because I okay. don't want to get taken down by Disney. Okay. So we can, we can talk over it. We can go pew, pew. Pew, pew. Pew, pew. 
So yeah, the game itself is actually very good. It's a, and I'll have I'm probably going to do this as an insightful mm-hmm. pick for next week. Uh, I just haven't had much play time, and I've ran into some technical issues with okay. it. Okay. Uh, once I get through those, I should be fine. I got stuck at chapter two. Chapter two keeps crashing on me on the PC for some reason. Mm, okay. Uh, just a couple of quick things to note here. One, it's very reminiscent of X-wing versus Tie Fighter. If anyone is a fan of that, from about 15 years ago highly realistic as you adjust uh settings to your ship you actually get a a view of the consoles on the ship and the consoles are interactive so when you throttle up you see your throttle indicator go up you see your power indicators change and stuff very cool the way it's done the other thing that's very neat that i'll throw out there real quick is that the game itself very uh cleverly blends elements of other expanded universe stuff okay Um, you have references to thrawn you have references to ray sloan who's in the novels that are the precursors to the new trilogy Um, you have references to uh, ships and ship designs and characters that were in previous games like battlefront 2 it's a borrowing of of various elements so it's a very familiar feel if you're a star wars fan and have kept up on all these things okay and even if you haven't they do a very good job of introducing these elements to you okay graphics obviously are incredible i'm not playing it in virtual reality Mm -hmm. Uh, it is available in in vr i don't have a vr headset however i do play on surround screen so i've got three 27 inch screens that i play so it's kind of virtual reality in some respects what it does and the interesting thing about that and the complaints that i've heard from friends who play in vr you can't see anything in a tie fighter just like you would expect okay on three screens i get one one window with a (laughs) with a round (laughs) window that i can see everything else is just hull (laughs) so and there's a shot of it right right but not a good type of ship to fly and they all have different feels to them which is neat okay some have more powerful guns some have shoot more missiles some are faster some maneuver better so you can change your loadouts you can change your character in there you can rank up it's a pretty extensive game and in the u.s it released at 39.99 which is very inexpensive that's not bad I'm running on a PC right now. I'll mm-hmm. probably wind up getting it for console too. But on PC, I'm running on a two generation old graphics card. I'm running on a uh, NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti right now. And that's more than powerful enough to run okay. at ultra graphics. So it's not particularly demanding on the hardware, uh, which is nice. So it makes it available to other people. Very detailed, very, very good gameplay. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's easy. You know, Madison sat down. Right. And within 10 minutes, she was terrified when she sat down. Right. Because she's bouncing off rocks and running <laughs> into ships. She was still crashing at the end, but. Within 10 minutes, she was able to actually get the flight okay. dynamics down. Uh, so it's not an overly complicated flight simulator. Okay. Very cool game. I recommend folks check it out. And, uh. I may have given away too much and can't do it as an insightful pick next eh, week. But you'll we'll have see. more because you'll have, you know, finished it or something. Yeah, I'm next hoping week. I'm hoping to have made my way through the rest of the story and can talk about that. Okay. So that is uh, Star Wars Squadron. Mm-hmm. Available for play now on PlayStation, Xbox, and PC. Very cool. So besides that, what else did we have? So it seems Cassie, uh, Cassian Andor is going to get a new direction. So Tony Gilroy is known as the man who saved Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Um, the uh, Gareth Edwards was the director of the film at the time and delivered a great first pass, but then... Uh, reshoots were done by Tony Gilroy. Uh, he wrote and filmed... Uh, the, you know, uh, did some reshoots of it and that basically, you know, secured Rogue One as a place in, you know, Star Wars as being, you know, one of the, you know, best movies, uh, you know, in, in 
current times. Um, so it's no surpri- surprise then that Gilroy was tapped to be the man who brought the prequel show starring Cassie or, uh, Cassian Andor to life for Disney+. Plus. So naturally, during the global pandemic that caused delays for production, um, you know, so now nothing, you know, everything's been, you know, rescheduled to to shoot um so deadline is now reporting that there is one more change because of the pandemic that tony gilroy will no longer be directing the first three episodes of the series um thanks to the covid related uh travel restrictions uh gilroy is still going to remain on as the showrunner and executive producer but he's stepping aside from directing duties and allowing uh, Toby Hayes to step in. Um, Hayes had actually directed the episode of uh, Black Mirror, which was kind of Star Trek meets, um, you know, the Twilight Zone, which was a very freaky episode. You know, one of the few episodes of Black Mirror that we that we actually uh, had watched. Um, so there's no official word on when uh, the show will actually start shooting. And there's no revised date. So maybe we'll see it in 2021 or in 2022. At this point, unfortunately, not really sure. So, yeah. And it, it's worth mentioning that Tony Gilroy, who the reshoots that he did do mm-hmm. for Rogue One, was he reshot the ending. Mm-hmm. So the original shooting of the ending, not to spoil the movie for anyone who haven't <laughs> seen it. If you haven't seen it, just close your ears right now. The heroes Mm -hmm. survived in the original Mm. shoot, and they didn't in the final shoot. Right. But the most important scene that he did shoot and include... Darth Vader. ...was the Darth Vader scene Mm. at the end. Because Darth Vader originally only appears once in the movie when uh, director Krennic goes to see him at his castle. Right. Which was okay, really not dynamic right and the reshoot that you see is the one that literally ends the movie right and the next scene is where a new hope picks up right and it was done it literally was the best part of the movie mm-hmm. it was just so you well you've done. gone back and watched that scene oh, many, i have it many i times. have it as a background an animated background on my phone it's so good right right And that's really what, to me, that's what made that movie Mm -hmm. was seeing Vader finally in action like that. And a man with that kind of creative genius, in my book, can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's unfortunate he won't be directing. Right. I mean, it's literally just a matter of circumstances that they're shooting in the UK and he's not there. Right. And he can't get there with the the pandemic. Right. Having him on a showrunner, I think, is going to be key Mm -hmm. to the success. Yeah. So that same article on Sci-Fi Wire also talked about our next story. Right. So more Mandalorian uh, reviews. No, rumors. (laughs) Woo! We reviewed the rumors. (laughs) We did. So did Pedro Pascal leave the Mandalorian? That's obviously the question that we've been talking about for a few weeks now. So new opinions on the subject have surfaced on Sci-Fi.com that suggest that there's really nothing to them. So the rumors began when YouTuber Grace Randolph, who has a history of reporting fake news, actually broke the news in her reaction video to the new trailer of The Mandalorian. In it, she claims that the leading actor walked off the uh, Mandalorian mid-season over concerns that he wasn't getting to act with his helmet off enough. Uh, so this didn't really pass the smell test on a lot of levels. Aside from Pascal's delight in interviews from the first season about learning how to act with a mask on, the second season had begun shooting well before the first season even premiered and finished before the COVID-19 lockdown. So, and then when you have uh, Lucasfilm mainstay, Phil Kostek? Sure, we'll go with that. Uh, Tweeting just last month that he was on set for the final month of shooting and he was able to interact with Pascal. So obviously he was still there. Um, Then when you add in that uh, uh, in an interview with People magazine um, that 
uh, Giancarlo Esposito. Hey, you got it. Congratulations. <laughs> who plays Moff Gideon, uh, saying that they were laying the groundwork for seasons uh, three and four. It makes it hard to imagine that the lead character would just walk away. So for now, take these rumors with a hefty grain of salt and we just have to wait to see how the Mandalorian will unfold for ourselves. And now that we are actually in October, <gasps> season two will premiere later this month on Disney Plus on October 30th. Now, I don't want to be the type of person that says, I told you so. But I did tell everybody so when we right. broke this first story. Absolutely you did. We can go back and play it even. I, I am on tape saying it's highly suspect that these Absolutely. rumors are true. There's probably some truth to them. Right. There's probably some friction. There's mm -hmm. and, and I honestly, I really think it stems back to the fact that it was ruled that he couldn't be eligible for an Emmy because right. his face wasn't exposed. Right. Um. So... It, it's almost like it was a conversation somebody had and somebody picked up the rumor there and just made the rest mm -hmm. up. No, I can see that. But the talks now, you know, we they've not talked about a third season. Right. So now we've got confirmation, a second confirmation of a third season and talks of a fourth season. Mm -hmm. uh, so things are looking pretty good for The Mandalorian right mm -hmm. now. So. Good news there. Bad news on the Disney side. I think we're balanced out at this point in right, time. Right, right. Let's move on to our entertainment news after this break. Sure. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai. Or what, what was it that they did? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, this was a story that came from uh, comicbook.com. It was actually an interview uh, that they did with uh, Billy Zapka, who played Johnny in the two seasons. Um, and when this came out, he had actually tweeted a um, a teaser for season three that since... Uh, this article came out, there's actually been a real uh, uh, trailer for uh, season three that, that came out. Um, so if you haven't watched any of the seasons, you probably don't want to listen because there's, you know, not really spoilers, but, uh, you know, a little, uh, little bit, you know, going on. Um, so season, the second season of Cobra Kai obviously left things kind of up in the air for, you know, most of its characters. Uh, the two, you know, karate schools found themselves, you know, in an all out brawl. And at the end, uh, Miguel's character, you know, ends up going to the ICU after being kicked, you know, off a banister or, or you know, uh, he fell, he fell, uh, he fell. He wasn't kicked. He jumped, um, you know, so you, you're not really sure where that kind of leaves everybody. Um, so, uh, the, uh, the actor who plays Johnny, uh, Billy Zapka had said, um, you know, nothing is as it seems. He, he says, I can tell you that, uh, listen for the characters of Johnny, uh, Allie, you know, he's been saying, he said, I've been saying, you know, for the last two seasons that she's a big missing piece of his life. She's the love that got away. 
And, you know, he would love to connect, you know, with her, um, you know, and the show is just full of surprises. He said, you know, the end of season two is, uh, you know, a car wreck, essentially. There's a lot of pieces to put back together. There's a lot of healing that has to happen. There's a lot of growing that needs to happen. It seems uh, like there were a lot of fan theories out there. And, you know, he said that was awesome. Uh, he said season three is fireworks and they think that you know season one and two combined are on steroids uh he said it was a blast to shoot and it's going to definitely be worth the wait he said uh we were hoping it would be out before now but obviously with the way everything is they're so happy that they have a new home on you know netflix to to share this with um he said you know that you know they they put a lot of work into it and that it's actually being translated into 30 countries uh you know so that's pretty cool um so again there was the little teaser where it's basically the cobra kai with just like a heartbeat monitor going on and then it kind of flatlining at the end but since then a new trailer has come out so if you do a search for a cobra kai season uh three trailer you can find it everywhere and it basically you know shows the majority of the cast obviously everybody's dealing with you know what happened at the end of season two and it also mentions that season three will be dropping on january 8th on netflix january 8th so we got a few months to wait for a few months so if you haven't watched any of it you did it as you know one of your insightful picks it's definitely been one of the shows that we both enjoyed um you know has a lot of campiness to it um you know you get to see things from a different perspective where you always thought that you know daniel you know was the good guy and now in some cases you're like wow he's kind of a jerk yeah. <laughs> you know and, and you feel bad for for johnny and a, and a lot of things so it's it's funny because i had uh <clears throat> someone at work come up to me just this week okay to ask if i watched it okay and it's funny because she knows that i'm a star wars fan and she always asks about star wars stuff okay i have no idea what prompted her to ask about this does she watch our podcast, maybe? She might watch the podcast. <laughs> Have you been leaving things around the office for people to watch? <laughs> but she came in and, and asked about it, and she had okay. the same exact impression. It was such a well-done series. Mm-hmm. It was campy, but it was campy in a comfortable, familiar yes. way. And it had just enough making fun of its original self uh-huh. that it it – endeared itself to you Mm -hmm. you know like you you you're invested in these characters like yeah you look at johnny and Mm -hmm. johnny is not this you know superficial one-dimensional person from the movies he's this complicated flawed individual who knows he's got his flaws and is trying to change himself Mm -hmm. uh ralph macchio's character is not this perfect he's pictured as perfect idealistic in the beginning of season one. Right. And then you see where the obsession starts to get to him. He mm-hmm. starts to neglect other things. Right. And you start to see some of his flaws. So the movie, the series itself, is so well done as far as character development. Mm-hmm. And then they bring in John Kreese and he's just flat out evil. Right. Um, and he still is evil, but he's right. evil in a very deceitful, yes, complicated way rather yeah. than just pure evil. Right. Um, so I, I, my hat is off to these writers because they mm-hmm. do a fantastic job of capturing the original, like watching the, the, the kid, mm-hmm. you know, go through their, their various iterations makes me glad that I'm not a kid who's trying to date anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, cause you, you, you capture all that awkward getting to understand yourself and your body and interacting with the opposite sex. And they do, they just do such a very good job. Mm-hmm. It's such a talented writing staff that they have on this show. Mm-hmm. And I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm glad we don't have to wait that long. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we just finished the last season last week or yeah, something like that. Yeah. So we're not waiting too long to, to watch. Season yeah. We, three. we kind of waited to jump on the bandwagon on, on this one. Yeah, so, so very nice. <laughs> However, 
one of the shows we do love might be in danger. Why don't you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, this is this came out, you know, uh, last week as well. Say it was a story about the Orville, which was one of our favorite shows, um, talking about that it's not canceled. It kind of sounds like Seth MacFarlane doesn't want to be part of it anymore. Now, this was also something that we were kind of upset about, too, because it had been on Fox and then they decided um, after the, the second season that they were going to be moving over to, to Hulu. Um, and we were kind of like, all right, great. I guess we're not going to be watching it because that happens to be one of the streaming services that we, we don't have. But we figured we would wait to see, you know, once it, it came out. So now it seems that there are some rumors that have been swirling that the Orville may be canceled, but maybe not. And maybe uh, only because he doesn't want to be part of it. So obviously different outlets have been talking about it. And it seems that Hulu at first maybe didn't want the show to go past a season three when other sources were saying that Hulu would love to have more of the show. But they see they can't seem to convince Seth Marlin, uh, McFarlane to sign another deal. Uh, so this article came from uh giant freaking robot.com um and it you know the story talked about how uh Zeth, Seth keeps telling them that he's ready to actually move on to other things and that he's kind of had you know enough of the Orville uh he was actually pitching the idea of killing off his character and handing the show over to someone else to run but Hulu doesn't want more of the Orville if he's not a part of it um so that's kind of been going the I guess some of the back and forth uh he wanted to kill him off at the end of season three um and maybe, you know, they're trying to convince him to come back for a season four. Then it seemed earlier in the week, uh, McFarlane was actually asked on an Instagram live if the Orville was being canceled. And he was very evasive about it. You know, he basically gave a non-answer. Uh, he says, you know, there had been a lot of speculation online. Will the show come back? Uh, the show is still a huge priority for me and for the cast and everyone else. We do have a season to finish and we're going to finish it. And that was basically it. Nothing more beyond that. But it seems that he has a couple of other projects in the work. So now, it you know, is it that he's just too busy for that or that he kind of wants to go in a, um, a different direction. So one of the series that he's looking at doing is actually for the Peacock streaming service, uh, which is called Skywatch. And Skywatch is set in the future where delivery drones um, turn evil and start attacking people. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> That, that sounds nice and happy. Um, and then he's also working on a limited series called The uh, Winds of War for NBC. And it's an adaptation of um, of the book. And it's a very serious uh, telling of World War II. So it kind of sounds like he kind of wants to go away from, you know, the comedy area and kind of focus more on, um, you know, some serious stuff. So, again, not really sure where that leaves the Orville, you know, obviously because of the pandemic, everything's, um, you know, been pushed out. So there's really no date yet for when season three is supposed to go to Hulu. And now are we even going to get a season four at this point? And it's unfortunate. We do love this show. Mm -hmm. um, but. I can't blame the guy for wanting to, to step out and do something mm -hmm. uh, different and, and expand his horizons. Mm -hmm. so we'll see. Yeah. You know, if they cancel, it might save us a Hulu subscription at least. Exactly. <laughs> so that was all we had for our entertainment news mm -hmm. this week. Uh, we'll be right back with uh, our insightful picks. <laughs> Go for your insightful pick of the week. So my insightful pick of the week is almost what I would consider American Horror Story next edition. <laughs> um, I, I've been a huge fan of 
American Horror Story since the beginning. Um, Ryan Murphy. Um, I was a huge fan of of Glee. I didn't watch some of his earlier horror stuff, but he's, you know, done, uh, obviously American Horror Story and has kind of, um, gone that route. Um, so, uh, this actually isn't American Horror Story, but it's kind of of that kind of has tastes of it, I guess, is, is, uh, what I could describe it as. Um, so it's actually called Ratchet. And it's based, uh, it takes place in 1947, where Mildred Ratchet begins working as a nurse at a leading psychiatric hospital, and beneath her stylish exterior lurks a growing darkness. Now, the character is actually based off of Nurse Ratchet from the book, um, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where this is supposed to be kind of her backstory, but not really. Um, but it's, you know, uh, another one of my insightful picks, uh, that was Ryan Murphy from, um, during the summer was Hollywood. Um, and it, it just had that feel, you know, like the storyline, you know, weren't a hundred percent true, but just the feel of the, the, uh, the 1920s and 1930s, uh, 40s feel, you know, it, it, the show had that, you know, that look to it. And this has this whole interesting, weird, vibe to it they do a lot of stuff with colors um you know where the lighting kind of changes you know and totally sets the mood you have this like whole yellow background and then all of a sudden everything goes blue and and just kind of weird um it's gruesome in certain areas it's definitely a horror movie it's something that they couldn't show on regular television so that's why i said it's kind of american horror story-esque um and everybody has their their little dark side, you know, each episode. Now, I haven't finished uh, the series yet. I'm about halfway through. But like everybody has their little dark side, you know, of how they got to where they are and, and what's, you know, what what truth are they hiding and what are they covering up and, and whatnot. So, so far enjoying it it's one of those i can't watch it all at one time because it does get a little you know gruesome um but it's definitely uh, an enjoyable so again if you're a fan of ryan murphy and and you like uh you know his darker stuff this is definitely uh for you all right good pick thank you So my pick this week is, uh, quite surprisingly, a documentary. Again, this one is on Netflix as well. It is called Challenger, The Final Flight. When the space shuttle Challenger blew up in 1986 on my birthday, by Mm -hmm. the way, it was the most shocking event in the history of American spaceflight. The deaths of seven astronauts, including the first teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe, were watched live on television by millions of viewers. However, that was more sho- what was more shocking was that the cause of the disaster might never be uncovered. And the documentary itself actually takes you through interviews with family members and various people. In fact, uh, Bill Billingsley, who was the kid from uh, Christmas Story. Okay. He was spokesperson spokesperson for the Young Astronauts program, oh, and he was involved as well. Okay. They brought him in to interview him as well. Okay. And what's interesting is you talk not just to the astronauts' wives and Krista McCullough's family. You talk to the engineers. You talk to the guys at the company that built the solid rocket boosters, and you find out that or very early on the dangers that they had and the concerns that they had about the solid rocket boosters and how the space shuttle was the first time that solid rocket motors were used because of how dangerous they were. Uh, solid rocket motors are like roaming candles. Once you light them, you can't turn them off. You can't throttle them. They're just on and they go until they burn out. And there were numerous studies because what would happen is the shuttle would launch, 
the solid rockets would detach yet at a certain point, and then the shuttle and the fuel tank. Because the fuel tank, everyone remembers the shuttle being a, you know, the re-entry vehicle, mm-hmm. solid rocket boosters, everything attached to a fuel tank. That fuel tank was the fuel for the three engines that were in the shuttle. So after the solid rockets detach, the shuttle would take the fuel tank up into orbit and then release the fuel tank. The solid rockets would then parachute back to the ocean. They'd be recovered. They'd be inspected, refurbished, and reused. Well, as part of that refurbishing process, very early on, they found defects in the design of the rockets and the O-rings to the point that they saw that there was physical burn damage to these O-rings. And people raised the concerns. They did experimentation. They They saw that temperatures affected it. So there was a mountain of evidence beforehand, before the Challenger disaster, that indicated the the danger that these this design flaw caused, and they still launched it. Um, So it's kind of a emotional documentary too, as you go in and you talk to the people who are affected by this, even down to the engineers who felt pressured by NASA to give the okay for the flight, mm-hmm. and these guys now have to deal with the guilt that's associated with it. It's, a, I think, a four-part uh, documentary series. Very well done. A lot of archival footage, a lot of interviews, and very well researched. Uh, I highly recommend it if you're a fan of the space program. Challenger, final flight available on Netflix. Good pick. Thank you. So we have an afterthought here, finally. (laughs) Just one little one. Um, So for those of you who are looking for uh, a Comic Con, next weekend uh, starts the New York Comic Con virtually online. Um, It's actually October 8th through 11th. If you do a search for New York Comic Con, this website is actually going to um, come up. It's uh, findthemetaverse.com. Um, they actually have a schedule listing of the different things. Uh, the majority of the stuff is free. There are some paid events that you can go to, I guess, um, you know, a little bit smaller things. Uh, they have featured guests. There's actually a area, um, for, uh, merchandise. Um, what's nice is if you actually go now and subscribe, uh, to their YouTube channel, you can get notifications when things become available. I'm guessing, Kind of like with San Diego, nothing's going to be done live. Everything's pre-recorded. Um, but what's kind of nice is, you know, if you miss when the panel showed up, it should, uh, you know, be on their uh, YouTube channel uh, as well. So Okay, cool. Well, it's nice to actually see that we're getting some uh, convention stuff going again here, even if it is virtual. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, one of the things, you know, we were, were talking about uh, just the other day, I happened to look in one of the fall activities that we've done for, for many years, uh, one of our little pumpkin fests. I happened to look just to see if they were, were doing it, and they actually... Uh, still are. Um, they're doing time tickets where normally, you know, the ticket would be all day. Uh, there, you can purchase tickets at the, the farm. It's, uh, Shady Brook Farms out in, uh, I think it's Bucks County, County, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so where a lot of things are, you know, if you buy tickets, you have to buy them in advance and, and online, but this one, they are allowing you to purchase tickets there, but they are encouraging everybody to, to purchase in advance time tickets, hay rides, obviously with limited amount of people. But, you know, as we were talking about, you know, just the other day, what's nice about that is it's all outside. It's very spaced out. You're not really ever on top of anybody unless you're on the hayride. But again, now they're spacing things out. Um, they used to do an evening event, which was all the, the horror attractions that they're not doing, but they're, um, horror attractions that they would have open during the pumpkin fest. 
are still going to be around. So basically you walk through the haunted house without any actors and all the lights are on. So it's not as, as scary. And they're doing that still, obviously spacing people out where you just kind of walk through. And another thing, um, is Ren fairs that normally we, we hit a bunch of the, the different local ones, but most of them, uh, were canceled this year, except, uh, the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair, um, which we're planning on attending later this month. Um, but that again is one of those you have to buy your tickets in advance. You can't, uh, show up at the gate to, to buy them. So you have to, you know, pre plan, uh, a trip for that. And again, that's another one very spaced out. Um, you know, so we'll obviously have a, a review of that. Uh, once we've attended that, but that, you know, something that we're looking forward to, yep. you know, you do it end. smartly, you do it safely. These outdoor venues can still be done. Mm -hmm. Wear your masks, social distance, be smart about it. Yep. And you can still enjoy your, yourself. Yep. That was all we had for, uh, the podcast this week. Uh, I would invite folks to check out our long form articles on medium at medium.com slash insights into things. Please do subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you subscribe to it, you'll get it as soon as they're made available. Monday mornings at 8. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, and anywhere. I would also uh, invite folks to contact us with your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find her on Find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream at least six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you subscribe to us uh, on Twitch, uh, you are a, if you are a Amazon prime member, you do get a free subscription to Twitch prime. That would help us out tremendously. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. We are available on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. And then uh, uh, if you want all of the audio versions of our podcasts, we are on podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. All of our high res videos are available on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And then links for Everything out there related to our podcasts are all on insightsintothings.com. And that's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.